one we are live hi everyone welcome back thanks for joining us again auto crit uh coming to you live with ali machete of the writers ally thanks for joining us i'm beth and we just wanted to take a few minutes to say thank you for everybody who is still participating in the auto crit community writers challenge we're about halfway through and it's time for our favorite bit editing so just got a couple housekeeping items to talk with you about today. Then I'll hand it over to Allie, who's going to share some tips on finishing and polishing your short story. Um, and then we'll have some demos also from Kevin of Autocrit to show you some of the key reports and how you can use those. We're actually going to be editing a real story that was submitted by one of our community members. So super exciting stuff. Hang in there with us. A um, couple of housekeeping items, as I mentioned, uh, the challenge runs through April 20th. So we will be accepting submissions if you want your story to be considered for that limited run 10 story anthology. Uh, we'll be accepting submissions for that starting Thursday of this week. And we'll be sharing information about how to submit those stories to our jury panel um, on Thursday in our Facebook group, as well as via email. So you should be able to get in pretty much all the info you need from one or both of those sources. Um, so stay tuned. I know a lot of you are really excited to submit your stories and we're excited to read them, but we want everybody to kind of come to the finish line together since it's a community challenge. So look for more information on that coming uh, on Thursday of this week. Also, if you are completing more than one short story, um, do submit only one. Pick your favorite. It's not like your kids. You can you can totally have a favorite story. Submit your favorite one, and that's the one that we'll uh, take into consideration for, for inclusion into that anthology. Um, and just a final note about word count. Uh, we've suggested around 5,000. That seems to be, depending on who you ask, pretty standard for a short story. But there's really no hard and fast rule about the minimum or the maximum. If you, as the author, as the creator, as the power behind this story, if you can tell the story in 4,000 words, in 2,000 words, in 5,500 words, um, go for it, right? The biggest, most important thing is that you're happy with it and that you're having fun and being creative during this time. So just wanted to um, mention those few little things. Um, today's session will probably run about 45 minutes an hour. We do want to try to get to all your questions at the end in the in the question and answer session. But if we're running out of time, just know that we will definitely get to those answers for you in the comments section, either in YouTube or in Facebook. So I see people joining us live already. Great. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have you. With that, I am going to hand it over to Ms. Ali Mashadi from the Writer's Ally, award-winning editor and author coach. Thank you so much. She's going to give us some tips and tricks on polishing that story and getting completed, reaching the finish line. And then she and Kevin are going to partner together with some auto crit reports that um, will kind of help improve your writing and take you to that next level. With that, Ali, take it away. All right. Thanks, Beth. And thank you all for being here. And if you're watching this recording later, thank you for your time as well. We appreciate it. So very roughly, most of you spent last week thinking through and then writing the rough draft of your short story. And now we're getting near the end. Um, so if you haven't started revising yet, you're going to want to shift gears to that very soon. And as you make that shift, I want to offer you some helpful tips. So first, let's just acknowledge that this is a crazy experience right? Many of you are trying to write in the short form for the first time. You have a very, very short amount of time to write a complete story and to edit it at least enough to compete in publication for this autocrit anthology, right? That's like crazy pressure, very short period of time. Now, most of you at this point, uh, whether it's finished or not, you probably have a very messy draft. In fact, it might be so messy, you might feel really bad about it. You might not even feel like it's a story. You might feel like what you really have is more like notes. So I just wanna take a moment to reassure all of you. That is totally okay. It is totally normal and it is 
how it is for all writers. I mean, minus, you know, the two week pressure part, um, this process of just creating what feels like a total disaster, what feels like a mess, what might make, make sense, something that you might not be happy with. It's not quite meeting with the vision you had in your mind when you sat down to start writing. This is how it is for all writers. This is the process. So don't let the gap between where you are and where you want to be intimidate you as you get into this revision process. Every best-selling writer in the world, you guys, was once exactly where you are right now with basically a super mess of words on a page, right? Every single one throughout history started this way. Nobody writes a best-selling best book fully formed from out of their minds, all right? Second, I want to say pat yourselves on the back for taking a risk for trying something new and hard especially those of you who have never written a short story before um you know just just congratulate congratulate yourself a little bit get some kudos right no one ever has to see this if you really hate it right that was not the point the point was to do something fun and creative and push your boundaries as a writer but you might surprise yourself you might find that you like uh, what you've written more than you expected to even. So just leave room for that possibility. And third and finally, I want to say, let's make revising and editing fun. If you can approach this part of the process with a sense of curiosity and play, you're going to get better results and you're going to enjoy it a little bit more. So what's on the page right now, those are your raw materials. Now it's time to see what shapes those raw materials can make. And those shapes can be different. Again, it may not be what you expected. The revision process, um, you know, I like to think of the revision stage as solving a puzzle, figuring out how the pieces work together the best way or figuring out what pieces might be missing that you need to add in and just sort of looking at all of that and clicking it all into place. That's really what this revision stage is all about. And when you use a tool like AutoCrit, which we're going to demo for you in a little bit, this whole part of the process, um, I think it actually helps it to feel a little more tactile, like you're playing with your draft. And as we all know, we're more likely to do something if it's fun. So I feel like anything that helps with that process is a great thing. So now let's talk about a few practical aspects of revising a short story to help you finish strong in the challenge. Now, again, I want to begin by saying, if it's at all possible, and for some of you it might not be, but if it's at all possible, given the short time frame that we have for this challenge, give yourself a little distance between <clears throat> when, you've, when you feel you've finished at least writing the draft, roughing it out, and when you sit down to start the, the real revision process, when you decide to sit down and go back through it. Give yourself a little bit of distance, even one day, even an afternoon, will give you fresher eyes and more objectivity, okay? Then, once you've been able to get those fresher eyes and objectivity, I encourage you to begin by sitting down in your writing space. Remember, we talked about that last week. Make sure you have some uninterrupted quiet time. And I want you to read what you've written from start to finish. Don't edit anything yet. Just read it. See what's there. See what still strikes you. You know, there might be a phrase, there might be an idea, there might be a moment uh, that you're reading through where you think, oh, that was actually really good, <laughs> you know, um, or conversely, you might find a part where you're like, oh, I can't believe I wrote that. That's fine. Make notes if they occur to you as you go, right? If there's things that you definitely know you want to keep or that you want to lose, go ahead and highlight those, make a little quick comment. But just note the obvious stuff, right? Because mostly what I want you to do in the beginning, this, this moment of assessing, um, is to just assess your needs and the next step. Sort of orient yourself before you actually dive into the revision process. Now, if you're not a planner, if you're a pantser, meaning, you know, that if you guys are familiar with the NaNoWriMo terminology, right? Planners are people who plot out the novel, make notes, sometimes an outline before they begin to write. Pantsers are people who usually just dive right in and start writing. So if you're not a planner, if you are a pantser and you did not write to an outline, I'm going to suggest that now is the time to make one. Now, I know that that might seem weird because you've already written the story. So let me explain how this works. First of all, so many of us hear the word outline and we immediately freeze up and we get cranky <laughs> and we think back to grade school where we were taught to make these outlines that were like very rigid and Roman numerals and, you know, specific like 
orders and structures and thesis statements and all this kind of stuff, right? I'm not talking about that kind of outline. I mean, if that works for you, that's great. Do what works for you. But, but for most of you, that's not the kind of outline I mean when I suggest that you write an outline. I'm talking about something that will serve as a roadmap that's going to reveal what's actually happening in the draft on the page, right? A map of all of your scenes, something that shows you all the major moments, the emotional moments, the major action moments, right? The inciting incident, the climax, these kinds of things. When you do this, it can be really helpful as a tool to get your bearings and see what might be missing. So it's going to be a lot easier to spot where there might be gaps in your plot structure, as an example, um, where the pacing might be off, where there might not be clear connections of cause and effect between each thing that happens, where you may have things happening that the reader doesn't actually need that can be removed so the story can be tighter, right? That's why you make an outline. So, you know, again, it could be index cards. It could be just, you know, sort of a point by point list. The form of it doesn't really matter so much. The point is to create that roadmap that, that basically shows what is actually happening on the page now that you've written it. Now, and if you did actually write to an outline, if you created an outline beforehand, now is the time to revisit that outline and make sure it still reflects what you actually wrote. And then you too can adjust it to match what's actually come out of the draft. So either way, you want to have some kind of an outline that maps out all of the important key points of the plot and the character development of your story. You want to think of plot as a skeleton, right? It's the bones of your story. And what you hang on those bones are going to flesh out the story, your scenes, your characters, your description. And it can be really hard to see that in a raw draft, especially if it's super messy because you were just like trying really hard to write, you know, to get in on the challenge. So bottom line, an outline can really help you see more clearly. So I encourage you to try it. Now, once you're clear on the frame or skeleton of your story and you've dealt with those big picture issues relating the plot. So, for example, as we talked about last week, making sure that your inciting incident happens in the first couple paragraphs. Right. If you've written a short story and it takes a thousand words to get to the inciting incident. That's no good. You don't have time for that in a short story. Once you address those big picture issues by looking at your outline, making sure the pacing is roughly good, making sure there's a logical progression of events, making sure that where you start and where you end, everything that happens in the middle gets you there appropriately and efficiently, now it's time to look at your economy of words. So we talked about this a little bit last week, right? Every single word, every sentence, every moment in a short story must contribute to the progress of the main story and or theme. You can't let your emotional attachment to your own work, especially when there's little bits that you love, keep you from trimming ruthlessly. And that is perhaps one of the most important skills this challenge can teach you, especially if you are not normally a short story writer, is that process of being able to trim ruthlessly. What am I talking about? I'm talking about killing your darlings. And this is a phrase many of you may have heard before, killing your darlings. It literally means to look for the parts of the story that you are emotionally attached to, characters that you love, lines of dialogue that you love, uh, scenes, moments, descriptions that you just love, but that might not actually be contributing to the story and don't really need to be there. So how do you recognize these darlings? How do you recognize these, these, these bits, these points? The key is to practice objectivity. Objectivity is hard for everyone, you guys, absolutely everyone, um, which is why so many people look for outside feedback from others, especially professional editors like me and my team, right? Because it's so hard to be objective about your own work. But you can cultivate your ability to get more objective if you can learn to recognize your darlings. So one of the clues that there might be darlings that you need to trim is as you're doing that review, as you're reading through your draft and you're noting parts that you love, don't love, whatever. If you start to feel yourself working on a piece, an idea, a character, a sentence that you're trying to make it fit in, right? If it doesn't already fit organically and you're sitting there trying to make it work, that might be a clue that the piece 
doesn't actually need to be there or shouldn't be there. That it might be something you're emotionally attached to and don't want to get rid of. So you're trying to, you know, do mental acrobatics in order to keep it and make it work, right? If you're doing that, it might be a darling. Ask yourself, does this really need to be here? Is it crucial to the reader's understanding? Is this character really necessary? Is this detail really necessary? Right? These are the kinds of things you can ask yourself when you feel that feeling, when you feel that feeling of trying to make something work. And it might be that it, it does. I mean, maybe it does really need to be there and you're legitimately trying to make it work and that's okay. But it'll start to help you get a clearer sense of, of what that feeling actually is. Is it because you just love that line and you don't want to get rid of it? Or is it because it's actually essential to the story and you just need to figure out how to piece it in properly? Okay. So I know all of this might sound like the exact opposite fun, uh, but as I said earlier, Autocrit can really help here. And I think in some ways, Autocrit even makes it more fun. So we're going to turn this over to Kevin, um, who's going to run us through just a few highlights of how Autocrit works and especially how helpful it can be in tightening your writing. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin from Autocrit. Uh, many of you may have heard from me before on our, our website, but if you haven't, um, Autocrit, as uh, Ali mentioned, is it's a self-editing application and a, a platform where we help you polish and edit your work. And really what's important about it, I find, is what Ali was mentioning, it, it really helps you become objective about what you've written by showing you your writing in a new way maybe freshen up uh, what it looked like before you finished it. So it kind of helps you get that distance by, you know, inserting, I guess, software uh, into the mix of your editing. So I'm not going to, I think the easiest way to show how Autocrit works actually is to demonstrate uh, on a piece of work. So we were lucky enough to have uh, one of our participants in the challenge. We randomly selected her. Um, we we're lucky enough to have the ability to look at an actual short story that was submitted to us. Um, it's one by the author Valerie Coles, uh, who provided the short story, The Mistake. Now, once again, this is a, 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 sum, a submittal one we had a couple of days ago, so it's a little bit rough, which is good because we're here to talk about how do we improve things. But I just want to say before we jump in uh, too far that I find it a real privilege to be able to look at some of these uh, works of art because somebody's this is someone's baby. This is someone's you know passion that, that provided this to us. And I don't want to take that lightly. It's really, really... Um, important to keep the goal of our minds as an editor that we're not, you know, the evil person with the red pen that's marking this all up and trying to be terrible and, and awful like the principal's office. But you no, know, instead what we're trying to do is, uh, I like the word coaching or helping, or we're, we're trying to help you make this better. We're trying to polish this. We're trying to push it to the next level a little bit and let you see your work in a, in a new and fresh way. And maybe there's a diamond in there, you know, and that's what we're going to help you find out by going through this process. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and load up the summary report. If uh, Ali, you want to mention a little bit of put this uh, kind of thing in context. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. No problem. Um, so yeah, a little bit of context um, so that you can really understand how Autocrit can enhance your writing and revision process. Or so for those of you who are new to writing, where it all fits in. So speaking very broadly, the strength of a story, whether it's a short story or a novel, right? Doesn't matter. Depends on sort of two main aspects. You've got the writing itself, like at the technical or the line level. And then you have the execution of the concept or what we call the big picture level, right? If the former is a disaster, if the literal like writing on the page, if your grammar is terrible, if the spelling is terrible, if, if you're jumping points of view every other sentence, then your concept or your theme isn't going to come across at its best. It might be confusing. It might be weakly portrayed. Um, it might distract or frustrate the reader so much they're just not going to care anymore, right? So these two aspects have to really work together. And Autocrit is a tool that deals with the technical level better than any other editing software I've ever seen, in my not so humble opinion. Uh, it is my very favorite, and it is really important to help you up-level those basic writing skills that are essential for letting your concept and your ideas come through. Now, that big picture level, that concept level, that's where the human editor comes in. So no software developed yet, at least, uh, can really address those issues. There's not a software tool on the planet that can tell you uh, if your plot is progressing logically, if um, your basic concept is compelling, if your characters feel authentic and real, right? That's what a human editor helps you with. 
And by the way, if you think your story or your writing in general might benefit from that level of review, just keep your eyes peeled for the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to have something interesting coming up for you. We'll talk about a little bit later. Um, now, as far as those basic writing skills, let's go back to that. Not only do you want to prevent your basic writing skills from keeping your readers at arm's length, speaking of working with a professional, you want to deal with those kinds of issues before you work with an editor, because just like any reader, if your editor can't see the forest for the trees due to basic poor writing skills or confusing writing, they're not going to be able to engage with your ideas either. So to do their best work where you really need them to, you want to remove those line level obstacles. And to be perfectly honest, and you know, this is how I make my living, so you know you can believe me when I say this, you don't want to pay a professional to tell you things that Autocrit could have told you for a lot less money. You don't want an editor to waste their time, you know, trying to just figure out what you mean on a sentence by sentence basis. You want them to tell you about those big picture issues that the software can't. So that's how those things work together. That's how you should approach working with Autocrit. Uh, you can expect a lot of it. It is an amazing, robust tool, as you are about to see. Um, but also understand, nobody is trying to say Autocrit takes the place of a human editor. There are some limitations. But if you work within that, you will get loads and loads of value out of it. So that said, let's actually look at how it works. All right. So I started here by running that story. Uh, through our summary report. And this kind of gives us a big picture, as Hallie was mentioning, where we start with. And the first thing you might notice is we provide a score. We get a lot of questions about the score, and it's it's used as a it's useful as a benchmark. I don't really recommend setting it as a target for anything, because uh, you know, some score up above, but this is really just uh, tracking your progress as you eliminate potential issues that are found throughout the work. So I don't want to dive too much into the score because we could be here all day just talking about that number. And it's not really the focus of uh, what we're trying to do here because you could get caught up in trying to pick a certain number and then not actually get any editing done. So that's not the point here. So as we roll down, we get the basic stats, the number of words. In this case, it's right around 5,000. So that's great. Now, when we start editing, as Ali mentioned, we want to, before you dive into looking at every single word, we feel it's best to try to pick the big structural issues first, like pacing issues, you know, number of paragraphs, you have too many, too big paragraphs, too little sentences, or, you know, characters and things of that nature. So the first thing I want to look at in this work here is the sentence analysis. This tells me how many different sentences I have of each length. And so it looks pretty good. Um, the average words per sentence is 13. We have a lot of short sentences, which is pretty good for a snappy, exciting story here, That's which, which is what this is. But I do notice we have four sentences that were 40 plus uh, words or more. So I'm going to go ahead and run the report and see where those are at. And I think you can probably improve things by uh, maybe shortening those sentences up and breaking them into different thoughts. Let's see here. If I click here, you can obviously see all the sentences. Uh, but I want to focus on the long ones here for pacing and for clarity. And the first one that jumps up, uh, when I read through it, it's a very action-packed sentence. Uh, some, you know, Anna is running, she's jumping, she's starting and doing a U-turn, hitting the accelerator hard. There's about four or five different parts of action in this one long sentence. And th the problem that happens here is, um, is clarity. And, and if there's a lot of action in your sentences, a good tip uh, that I always, I'm not even sure where I heard this from, but it's always kind of stuck with me. A tip is, is that the length of your sentence should match the emotion and action of what you're trying to portray. That's a, usually a good indicator that, you know, I have short snappy sentences when a big action scene, you know, things are moving quickly. But when you lengthen it out like this and you add a, you know, I don't know how many commas are in this sentence, but it's just something that I feel could have been portrayed and had more power and clarity if you broke it up, threw some white space on there, and you know, kind of let the reader feel the action when they read it instead of trying to jam everything into one sentence. So Autocrit's good at finding things like that. You might not even notice it by just reading it until you say, oh, you know, that is a long sentence, and there's another long sentence. And so then you kind of go through and you can kind of, a little bit of polishing in that regard can have a great impact on the pacing and how your reader reads and feels about uh, these areas of your work. So I find that's a you know, pretty helpful tool here. Just we have another one similar to that for paragraphs. You know, if you have really long paragraphs, obviously the idea is not to remove every single long sentence, but to limit them and realize how people are gonna be reading and feeling when they're going to be uh, digesting that part of your story. So 
Let me jump to another big area that I think Ali was mentioning in her first call, which would be point of view. Let's see here, word choice, point of view. Point of view is another big structural issue um, in these uh, stories in where you got to kind of pick where you're going to come from, who's going to be the you know, protagonist, who's going to be the antagonist, and who's, you know, in what mind you're going to live in, especially if you're going to have an omniscient type point of view. Whose feelings and whose head are you going to be in to see the story? And in this case, um, in this story, we had an exceptionally large number of characters. I counted up a dozen. I loaded them in here. And in a short story, we have a dozen characters. And I'm able to throw them into autocrit and have them be highlighted the character names. And in addition to having a large number of characters for a short story, which is, isn't always the, the, the best because you have to try to explain who these people are and you have you know, an economy of words, you also have to then worry about, am I, am I trying to show the story from two different, too many different points of view? And I think I found an area here where we hop from Anna in an omniscient point of view. We switch to Philip, and then in the next paragraph, we switch back to Anna again from that point of view. And that is kind of, from a clarity standpoint, a confusion standpoint from the reader, it really can be jarring when you start popping into different people's heads, especially when they're back to back from one paragraph to the next. I don't know if you want to mention something on that, Ali, on your end. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we did talk about that last week, right? Um, it's not that there is a rule per se, right? I couldn't say with authority that there is no short story in the history of short stories ever written uh, where there is more than one point of view. That said, because it is such a short work and because you have very limited time to develop uh, a relationship between the reader and that character, and as Kevin mentioned, every time you introduce a new character, you have to take up more real estate on the page because you have to describe that person. You have to explain a little bit about who they are and how they relate to the protagonist. They might have a role in the story that's big or small. Um, so generally speaking, when you write a short story, you want to have one protagonist with one point of view. Now, it might be first person point of view from the protagonist, or it might be third person point of view still limited to that protagonist. Um, and it doesn't mean there can't be other characters in the story, but 12 is certainly a lot of characters for a very short story. And probably what's happening um, is that it's becoming distracting. Some of them may not have been developed clearly enough. It may be a little confusing how some of them relate. Um, and the story probably would benefit from perhaps combining some of these characters. If, if there's a, an important role that they serve, perhaps one character can serve the role of two or three minor characters. Um, so, you know, it, and just to note about how this report works, we noticed that some of you in the group are posting some confusion about like, do I have to accept everything Autocrit says? It doesn't seem to make sense. It is still a piece of software, you guys. You have to engage with it. So what this is showing you is where a character name appears. As you review it, some of those character names might not be indicating point of view shifts. It might simply be, you know, that you're describing. Anna did this, Philip did that. Um, so many of them might be fine, but it is a great clue if it's highlighting a ton uh, of character names that you might have too many and you should definitely make sure that point of view is sticking with one character for the story. Thanks, Allie. And like we were mentioning earlier, this is a big, this is a structural issue, right? If you have to eliminate characters or switch characters or combine them, or, you know, like we we're mentioning killing your darling, that's a pretty big change. So you kind of want to look at these things first before you start analyze, analyzing how many times you use the word setting or something like that. So it's kind of important to try to look at the big picture. And then once you kind of get it dialed in with your outline and your, your plot and you have your characters set up and, and you have your sentences and things the pacing seems to be flowing well, now's the time to kind of skip to the next level. And that's where Autocrit really, really excels is we're amazing at analyzing your word usage and finding the frequencies, uh, basically the, how many times a word appears, and then comparing that to how many times that word would typically appear in, uh, in a different genre or an author. In this case, we're comparing to short story as it shows here. So let's jump to one of these word by word comparison reports. And I think a fun one that we always, I don't know, we always, it's like a, something you always kick around is adverbs because they're, you know, everybody's bane you know, to existence here with a writer that uh, we always typically want to look at those and see if we can eliminate them if we possibly can. So let's run a report, uh, the adverbs report. And this report is going to find every use of an adverb in your text and tell you how many times you used it and also tell you 
okay? Based on whatever you're, we're comparing it to, in this case, short story, you've used it too many times and you should probably remove some of them. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to remove all of them, as we, we show here. It's like, you know, th th there's going to be adverbs. Although you try to limit them, there's probably going to be adverbs somewhere. But the idea is, let's try to limit their use and try to use strong writing and stronger verbs to eliminate them so that overall story will be better. So you can see here, if you use the summary, we'll notice that, you know, we're, we're in the good shape. We have only 55 adverbs totally found. So we're, we're excellent. However, there's always room for improvement and they can't just ignore it. So let's take a look at something like uh, found quickly here. So we see the word quickly used in conjunction with a uh, dialogue. So it's a dialogue tag, basically, or it's, a, you know, it's in the conjunction with a dialogue tag. So this is kind of like a double whammy. First off, you, adverbs are kind of weak as we know. And then it's second off, we see that it's used in conjunction with dialogue. And I guess the point here with dialogue is we, we hope anyway that the dialogue itself will convey that she's speaking quickly or that the, uh, the sentence structure itself will say, oh, I don't need to be told that she's speaking quickly. That's kind of a, you know, it takes a lot of practice and work to try to work that in that way. Or, but basically, do we need that at all? Can we just eliminate it? We need to say and said. Hopefully the dialogue could stand on its own and the sentence can stand without that. That would be the goal. I think we had another spot here under hurriedly where Anna said hurriedly. Hopefully, this section of text and this section of dialogue is strong enough to convey the fact that she's speaking hurriedly or find another way, find a, what they call beats or something else to use uh, or her motion or her, uh, maybe she was agitated somehow. Find another way to, to let the reader know that she's in a hurry rather than just simply telling them that. And it's like I said, it takes a lot of practice and effort. But with something like Autocrit, it will show you when that happens. And so you can't really step away from it. It's like, do I need that adverb? Is it there? And, and why is it there? And so that gives you a chance to improve it fairly quickly, really. Uh, if you do, if you uh, can just delete it, that's the best. And your, your dialogue is strong enough to stand on its own. So... I think that's a good one. And another spot we get a lot of questions on is what happens if I have a highlight or, or an indicator located inside a dialogue? And Ali, I'll let you take this one. I think you, uh, you had a good idea on, on when you throw something like Shirley into dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so adverbs in particular are a good example of this, but really any report where you're looking at the autocrit is showing you a potential problem in dialogue versus out of dialogue. So we all know that dialogue represents somebody speaking and people don't always speak uh, in, you know, Oxford level English grammatically correct sentences. So autocrit might be telling you that there is a problem, sentence structure, grammar, whatever inside of dialogue. Um, but you have to know as the author, is that choice deliberate? And what is this choice saying about my character? Is this a character who actually would speak this way or not speak this way? So even when Autocrit is showing you something that may not actually be a problem, it will highlight something for you that you should consider. Um, so in this case, uh, it's highlighting Shirley in the dialogue. Is it a problem to have an adverb in dialogue? No, but is this character someone who would say something like Shirley? right? That's a, that's a voice issue. Um, it's not something you would typically hear uh, a young hip person say. It's a little bit old fashioned. It's a little bit British, uh, in fact. So those kinds of things come into play when you're looking at this report. And as Kevin said, you know, when you look at it, you might decide you want to delete it entirely. Um, but another thing that's really cool about the adverb report is in addition to finding places where you can just delete a word, uh, which helps with your economy of words. So that's great. It also highlights opportunities, uh, as I mentioned, for us all to think more closely about your voice, about your dialogue, but also to replace weak adverbs with stronger verbs. So for example, um, I don't think we, we have an example in this particular story, but uh, quickly was one of the words that this report brought up. So let's say for example, um, that there was a phrase in the story where the character ran quickly, right? Instead of said quickly, let's say the sentence said ran quickly. Well, that's two words, right? And adverbs are generally considered weak. So what could we say instead of ran quickly. Perhaps you could use the word sprinted, 
right? Sprinted is a stronger verb that means ran quickly. That's one word instead of two. So you've traded out two words that are kind of weak for one much stronger word. That's really perfect economy of words. Perfect. All right, so similar to adverbs, thank you very much for that, Ali. Uh, we can also look at other things too that perhaps are filler or unnecessary or you know they just don't necessarily belong there. So we call them unnecessary filler words. And those are words like just, that, very, then. So for example, here we find that we use very five times. And the first one is look very glamorous today. Uh, you just look glamorous. Is it really anything like very glamorous? It seems you're adding in an extra word to describe something that's already doing a fine job itself. Glamorous is a, it's a fine word it's by itself, standing alone. So you're adding words that just fill uh, fill the space, and they don't they're not needed. So it's simply, you know, run this report, go through and find some of these. You can actually just get rid of them if the word is in the sentence speaks fine without it. And also, you can see, okay, I've used that very five times. I've also used just 23 times. So it kind of gives you a word count and you see, you know, sure, that might be necessary to use just there, but down here, you might not need it. So, you know, and enjoy the ride. What do, you, do you need to say just enjoy the ride? Can you just say enjoy the ride? So just these things about the economy of words, clearing it up and having clarity and succinct, clearly written uh prose is, is amazing what it can do. Just a couple of swift, quick changes here, and you don't necessarily have to get rid of all of them. That's not the point here. It's just seeing when you've overused them or seeing patterns or repetitions and things inside your text that can kind of cause your reader to lose interest or great. They might even know why they're not interested anymore, but it becomes annoying to the reader after a while if you keep using the same crutches and same filler words and things that don't necessarily need to be there versus getting straight to the action of and the plot and, and moving the plot along in your story and kind of driving it, especially in a, in a, in a story like this, where the whole point is this, this girl is being chased by a boyfriend. So that's kind of the point of this. And so we want, really want to get there as quickly as possible, not have to read through a bunch of filler words. Um, and you'd be amazed at how much of an impact it can have just to eliminate some of these words and how much cleaner it feels to read it. So let me jump to the next section here, which is probably my favorite would be repeated words, kind of, kind of dovetails right into it. When we're talking about repeated words, I'm not talking about words that are like back to back next to each other. We're looking for words, like in this case, knocked, that are used within close proximity to one another. And as, as humans and as writers, we have a certain number of words in our vocabulary we use all the time. So we always fall into a, a trap, whether we know it or not, especially when we're dumping out a lot of words on a page for a competition like this, of using the same handful of words that we always use in our toolbox. And without you know expanding that we're using synonyms and are expanding our vocabulary, what ends up happening is you have the same words over and over again without your text. You might not even realize you put them there because they're your favorite words. However, when you read it back and you see it, you might not even notice it because they're your favorite words. Autocrit is excellent at identifying, okay, you use this word very close to each other. Maybe it's time to, instead of saying knock, maybe he was bumped something like that. And in this case, it might not be too big of a deal. I mean, is isn't, isn't too bad. But when you come say to this next word with coffee, you know, in this, in this scene, they're drinking coffee. Well, we mentioned in this story that we, we were drinking coffee one, two, three, four, five, six times in a matter of the same number of paragraphs. Every single paragraph mentions the fact that they're drinking coffee or something about coffee. So instead of saying coffee, why don't you just say, you know, she, she took a sip from her cup or she took a sip or somebody handed her a cup instead of sending, handing a coffee. Just little things like that can actually make a huge difference um, in how it reads and how, how fresh it feels and how new. And I'm not going to say it becomes a cliche, but if you keep using the same word over and over again, it becomes tiresome to read. So we, we know by the first or second time that they're drinking coffee, maybe the third and fourth time we use something else. We spice it up. We, we you know, we call it a latte. I don't know. Come up with something to where it becomes a little bit uh, new and fresh to the reader when they read it. Ali, do you have anything you want to say on that one? Yeah, and uh, I apologize because I, I really should have mentioned this earlier when you were looking <laughs> at the summary report. That's all right. Um, one of the things that's really cool about Autocrit, which you can see in this example, is look at the tabs across the top. So you start with the summary, then you have pacing momentum, dialogue, strong writing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
it's kind of organized loosely in an order that really facilitates a great revision process. Because the thing about revisions is that they work best in iterations, right? Or as we call them in the editorial world, passes. So every time you do a round of revisions, you want to be looking at a small subset of issues. You don't want to try to look at every single problem possible every time you go through. Um, first of all, it's going to be very overwhelming and stressful. And also, it's just not effective to do it that way. So keeping this in mind when you first run the summary report, it might seem overwhelming with all the options for analysis. But what you notice is it breaks everything down in chunks. So this repetition report is a really good example of why sort of working your way down from issues that are a little more substantive, like perhaps point of view and the number of characters, and then leaving things like repetitive words or, or grammar uh, or filler words for a little bit later in the process. Because let's imagine you ran this first and you made yourself nuts going through and replacing all of these words and you know rewriting sentences and trying to avoid repetition and filler words and you do all this work. And then you go back to that POV tab and you realize I have 13 different characters. I need to combine some of these and I did change things around and oh my gosh, I, I slipped in and out of point of view. I have to fix that too. Well, by the time you're done revising more substantively to address those issues, guess what? Everything you've done on a line basis, not everything, but a lot of what you've done on the line basis has changed. You're going to have to go back to that repetition and filler words report again. So you've kind of created more work for yourself in doing in that way, right? This is like thinking of it as like a process of tuning, getting narrower and narrower and narrower. So, you know, what you'll also see that's interesting is if you look at the list, uh, the number of repeated words, for example, like it gives you here on the right, you can see there's a total of 52. That number might actually change between the time you first run that summary report and after you've dealt with some of those first few tabs, right? So that's what I'm talking about. If you see that list of words reducing naturally while you deal with the other stuff, you've just saved yourself some time and some work. Perfect. Thanks, Ali. I appreciate that. So we're obviously coming up to a little bit of a close here on using uh, the autocrit system. But before I go, I just want to mention, obviously, we've, we've only showed a couple of things. We've showed uh, three or four reports where we have over 20 of them. I even lose count sometimes myself, and I should know. But uh, it's, uh, we have a lot of really neat things in here that will help you, I guess, I just maybe see your work in a new way. And one of the uh, new ones we've come up with, let me run the summary report again, so you can kind of get a feel for some of the different things we can do um, with the system for you. And that is, we have a new report called, let me scroll to it here, Power Words. This is just an example of one of the many reports we have. So in this case, we have compiled a list of words that draw some emotion or an experience for a reader that have been de dedicated to certain categories of feelings like encouragement, anger, safety, uh, forbidden greed. In this case, like I mentioned earlier, this story is about a girl being chased by her boyfriend who may or may not kill her. So fear, fear words, it's great. You see that all oh, 50% of my power words are fear-based. So that's just, I, you know, it's just another way to, like Ali was mentioned, making it fun to write or just maybe I need to throw more fear into my work. If, if you're writing a horror story and you have, you know, encouragement and safety, that's okay, I guess, but maybe you you know, you have greed in there a lot. Like, why am I? So you have to kind of make, are the words I'm using trying to portray what I'm trying to convey with my, you know, my, my plot? What am, I, am I driving my story along? Are the words I'm using appropriate? And so this is where this kind of comes in here. And, and, and that's where Autoquick can help. Like, are there actual words you're using working with what you're trying to bring across to the reader? So that's just one of the many exciting uh, reports that we have with the system. And as I mentioned earlier, when we do go ahead and run a comparison, we're actually comparing to published fiction. And so in addition to, you know, obviously we picked short story here for this purpose, for this challenge, but we also have a wide range of genres, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. And also if you want to pick a particular author you want to compare to, say, I don't know, Daniel Silva. You can choose that and it'll rerun uh, and it will change your analysis based on how many times you would expect to see that appear in a Daniel Silva book. So and it, it, it kind of adds to uh, making editing interesting and fun and just kind of keeping you engaged with it and try to focus 
per se on how many times you use different words and how, how your patterns and your writing match up to different uh, elements of published fiction, either in genre or by author. So we're kind of, as Ali mentioned earlier, this process can be painful, but we're trying to make it less painful. We're trying to make it interesting and exciting and give you a partner to edit alongside you without having the, the painful step of maybe giving it to a beta reader and facing criticism from a friend or a, a family member, you know, maybe it's your wife, I'm not sure, or your husband. But this is kind of a, you can kind of edit and get feedback in a safe environment. And so where you, you polish and you self edit quite a bit. And once you feel more comfortable with it, then you have confidence in your word usage and your pacing, then you, then you feel better to send it out to somebody else. And it's in a much better shape. It's a much better position to send it to an editor like Ali for the, you know, to get an opinion. Cause obviously you can't, well, you, you can, but it's all, it's always a benefit to have a group around you to try to pull something like this, a project, to put it together. So you need help from, you know, live editors, you need help from beta readers, but we're saying that with Autocrit, hopefully you can do a lot of this work yourself and feel confident about it when you, when you, you send it out and you've, you've analyzed your story from a number of different ways, you've had it from a, you know, you looked at it from a new way and you, you, you get a good feel for it. So that's what we're, our goal here is with Autocrit is give you that, uh, you know, that fun, exciting way to look at your work in a new way and uh, go ahead and have fun editing. So I think with that, I think that kind of closes out what we can squeeze into this little uh, short demonstration without going too far. So I'm going to pass it back on to you, Beth. Great. Thanks, you guys. Ali, Kevin, that was amazing. And Kevin, you have lots of fans out there. They're both <laughs> that you are a real human being. <laughs> brains behind a lot of our Autocrit customer interactions. So we really appreciate that. And everybody's excited to see you. A um, couple of quick questions that have come up in the chat. One, um, what about those fingerprint scores? Can you walk us through that quickly? Sure. Jump back over to the summary report. One second here. So the fingerprint is right here. What this is showing us is just a simple count of the number of highlights or indicators found in each one of these categories. So basically, we have 49 dialogue tags. We have 234 highlights in the word choice category. And these match up with the main heading uh, tabs up here that Ali was mentioning earlier about. So we're like repetition, we have 165 highlights in the repetition category. So if you were to run this, all these reports under that category, you would find 165 highlights. So it's just kind of giving you a stat of where do I stand, you know, and it's really helpful when you compare one, say one revision to the next and say, I started out with 24 and now I got 20. So it kind of gives you motivation in your, when you improve as you see how you're, you're uh, making improvements to your, your text as you go. So it's kind of a, just a, just a helpful tracking stat and it's a count. At one point we had uh, percentages there, but we've switched over to counts just for simplicity's sake. Um, Cause it's really all the important part is here is just, keeping track of where Autocrit is finding th things to look mm -hmm. at and to analyze. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, just a, just a quick point of clarification sure. uh, for myself as well. I noticed that um, the numbers work a little differently, right? Because your overall score, you're trying to increase that score. And down yes. here, you're trying to reduce those numbers, right? That is correct. The overall score is a, is a combination of all these numbers is a ratio between the amount of indicators we find and the total number of words found. So the total word count in your file has a huge impact on your score. So basically you have so many highlights, so many highlighted words and so many not highlighted words. The better you are with the fewer highlights, the higher your score is gonna be. The maximum you can get obviously is 100%. But so really you wanna be, dri be driving these numbers down and the number of indicators you have and you want to be hopefully lifting your score up as an indicator that you have eliminated some of the indicators found by Autocrit throughout uh, throughout your text in all the categories. Excellent, great. Um, and might that also lead into a second question that we saw? Is there a recommended or standard order in which to uh, work through these reports? Or does that really just vary based on the author or based on the score? Or what are your thoughts on that, Kevin and Allie? 
I'll let Allie take this one since she's <laughs> <laughs> she she runs the editing through more <laughs> as a professional side. I, I, sure, sure. Um, well, like I suggested, um, I think the tabs are actually arranged pretty well as a general rule. Um, so you know, looking at pacing and momentum, looking at your dialogue. Um, you know, the, the certainly starting with the summary to get uh, orient yourself at you know, what's going on in your draft is a good place to start. I think it's going to be a little different for everybody. So if you look at your summary report, um, can you scroll down to that fingerprint again for a second? Sure, sure. So, you know, let's look at this, right? Um, in looking at this, we have a really high number on strong writing. And we have a fairly high number also with repetition and word choice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, things like word choice and repetition are the type of things that I recommend leaving for the end of the revision process. Um, because you know you can you can spend a lot of time swapping out words, deleting words, rephrasing sentences to avoid having to use an adverb, so on and so forth. But if you haven't dealt with the fact that you have too many characters, or if you haven't dealt with the fact um, that your pacing is too slow and so you're going to need to take some scenes out, then you know you might be creating more work for yourself. So I, I suggest finding a balance between where you have the most problems, keeping in mind that if those areas are these sort of more very very word by word level reports, um, that even if they are your biggest problem areas, I would still kind of leave those for later. So it's a little little bit of a, a little bit of a, a juggle for everybody, if that makes sense. Is that helpful? Yeah, sure. And, and just to remember too, when we, we look at this, one of the reasons why we have so many highlights in strong writing is because there may be more reports in that category. So we've got to be somewhat cautious too. Like, and under strong writing, we have you know one, two, three, uh, six, six of them or eight of them, and we go to pacing, we only have four. So right. be somewhat cautious when you look at that. Oh, I have this is my big. You could your weakest point still could be pacing and momentum, but you know it's, these are, I guess not every highlight is created equal. Let's call it that, right? Ali was saying some of our structural problems with number of characters and pacing issues and sentence. You know, you have your your paragraphs are just too long. Those are bigger issues than you used, you know, this word too many times, perhaps. So you've got to be, you can't just compare apples to apples here because these are in different categories. They represent different weights, I guess you could say, from a re regard to. So, and we find, I mean, like Ali was saying, it's kind of a little bit up to you, but definitely focus on the structural stuff first and then kind of wind your way down as you as you polish it down to the, the, the specific words i guess that's a at least our recommendation but you don't have to i mean everybody's some people <laughs> some people like to work they may want to re rewrite it 20 times 30 times i don't know yeah it depends on it also depends on your day right like yeah. have you ever sat down to do work like i don't i know i do this sometimes mm -hmm. and you're just you're just really tired and you're like i just can't engage <laughs> with dialogue right now like i want to make some progress i want to get something done but i just i, I do not have the brain space to mm -hmm. deal with dialogue so you just go straight to you know repetitive words because that's just easier to tackle like that's going to happen there's no wrong way to do it um but i do think autocrit has made your job mostly a little bit easier uh you can literally just work through the tabs from left to right and that's probably a good uh broad framework especially for those of you who are new to the tool yeah i think um i think it would be really interesting to reach out to our autocrit writer or our autocrit author community in Facebook and ask the users there what they prefer to do. I think we'll find a lot of variation. You know, some people specifically go in a different order or uh, whatever resonates with their voice or whatever they're feeling up to that day. I, I kind of can see all of those being great, uh, great approaches. At the end of the day, whatever is creatively decided um, by the author, it's your creation. Trust yourself and <laughs> yeah. dig in and go for it. Yeah. So the, one more quick question from the community and then we will um, wrap it up and sign off for today. Um, those lines around, we get this one a lot, Kevin, you know what I'm gonna ask. You know what I'm gonna ask. Yes, <laughs> I know. Those, those. <laughs> uh, so these, these little circles at one point had a meaning. They, they did, we had, we had iterations after iteration of Autocrit and they have a meeting based on the overall categories. And 
we got we lost the meaning along the way. At some point, it's just like ah, they just don't make sense anymore. But we left the graphic because we really like the graphics. So honestly, these circles are really just a graphical element right now. They do change based on your score. But to be honest with you, the the meaning would be so convoluted. Like you have to add this plus that divided by that. You know, at the end, it doesn't. It's just a graphic. So really, the focus <laughs> point here is the is the score. I wish it was more. Now that everybody's interested in it, it's like it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're trying to find out what the mystery is here, but no. Yeah. It's, it's, it's your little open any secret decoder ring. You no, know, no, no. This, yes. No, it's just a graphic. <laughs> it's, a de it's a decoy. What can I say? I don't know. Yeah, no, <laughs> it looks cool. It just looks cool. It does look cool. And it, and it symbolizes the different iterations. So you have yeah. like the short iteration okay. and the uh, long iteration. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in. I'll, I'll put that in. Well done, Allie. Well done. <laughs> Great idea. Thank you so much. Um, Ali, thank you. Kevin, thank you so much. Visitors, viewers, we've had uh, nearly 100 people view us live today as we walk through uh, some tips and tricks to polish and finish up your short story, getting ready for submissions in our auto community writing challenge. Those submissions, again, will open up on Thursday this week. Challenge runs through the 20th, so we'll have plenty of time for everyone to reach the finish line together. If we didn't get to your questions in the comments, uh, bear with us. We will definitely get to those uh, responses in the community and here on YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, for example, strong writing. I know there's a lot to dig into under that uh, tab. And we've got some great articles that we can share with you in the community. So what you have seen today is a combination of paid and free reports within the AutoCrit tool. My favorite, the adverb report, and Kevin's favorite, the repeated words report, are both free. So anyone who has a free forever user account in AutoCrit um, already has access to that. Some of the others that we went through today, point of view, consistency, and the really fun one, showing versus telling, another one of my favorites, those are examples of paid reports available in the professional edition, which is what we were demonstrating here today. Great news. If you have a free forever account or if you're brand new to AutoCrit, you can still get that 14 day professional level subscription for $1. I'm going to go ahead and post that link in our Facebook community. My uh, buddy Gareth is going to send that out via email. And we're going to have it available inside the AutoCrit application for you. So never worry, never fear. You can still take it. I know it's going to underdog will soon be here. I think is the way that goes. Don't call me Shirley. I saw you out there, Ken. <laughs> don't worry. We can still go in that 14 day professional level trial for $1. We'll make sure that we get that out to you today. As a matter of fact, I think it went up in our Facebook group about 10 minutes ago. Click through, take advantage of all of these reports, play around. And you know, during that 14 day trial, not just the short story for the challenge, but also that novel you've had tucked away, run it through there, see where you can get started um, while those creative juices are flowing editing on your novel, on your YA, on your romance, on your science fiction. Um, uh, in the professional version, you can also change the genre. What we're comparing to today is a short story. You can select fiction, nonfiction. You can select sci-fi, YA, self-help, romance, you name it. So you can get really specific in the genre as well as comparing to a specific author. So. Whew, lots of information in that wrap up. Uh, any last questions, comments, show ideas? Looks like we're good in the chat windows. Allie, again, thank you so much. By the way, out there um, in our viewer land, we will be back on the 21st with another live stream to do our drawing for those prizes, um, including some uh, book cover design, the deluxe package from Book Baby, as well as AutoCrit memberships, Amazon gift cards, and more. So we will see you again soon. Everyone have a great day and have fun editing. <laughs>